Hi, everybody. I'm here. Um, <laughs> I thought this would work out at eye level and, uh, and a bit more uh, relaxed, everybody digesting their lunch, etc. So, that's me. What do I do? Uh, I make digital stuff work for people. Uh, I connect the dots, you could say. I run a design shop in uh, in Berlin, and uh, I've worked with the uh, with the game project since the first LG game. That's uh, that's 2006, and uh, this talk is about doing some complicated things or designing. Well, let's put it, the future of GIMP. So, certainly I realized I've only effectively about 15 minutes to tell you something here. So, and uh, 45 seconds along the way already. So I thought, what am I gonna tell you? Uh, what is it really that I want to uh, present and, uh, and give to you today? In January, this uh, on Twitter, this uh, this image uh, showed up. I think it's quite clear what the background of it is, uh, and uh, that was interesting enough. What was even more interesting was the first comment that came on that, the first tweet uh, from Anita, who I don't know personally, but it drove home the point quite exactly. Uh, what that image or what what is wrong with it. So this talk is gonna be about nuts uh, or more. It's gonna be how not to drive your users nuts uh, and how to do this through design. Finished, Jim Mac? And <laughs> Thank you. The other part what this talk is gonna be about or what we can combine this with is it's about context. The use of context in design. Uh, I will talk a lot about context these remaining 13 minutes. So, and overall the talk is a reaction, a continuation to, a continuation and a reaction to the reaction to my previous talk on Gaggle. This was in, uh, in Brussels, uh, the write-up of that. Quite a lot of comments in my blog, and uh, this part addresses them, but addresses them in a way of explaining what's what's behind the thinking that uh, that's been going out up to now. And yes, it's all about context. So let's look at the context. One of the commenters said, "Oh, you got to look at Nuke. That's really the king of the hill at the moment uh, when it comes to." Compositing from doing node-based uh, node-based editing. So here we are, Nuke. That's a uh, it's a bit reduced. Normally 1280 pixels wide. Uh, this this window or this screen, and from how it is built, uh, you can already deduct actually what is the context that it's uh, that is actually used. First of all, that's where the result is. That's, that's the output, that's what it's all about. Uh, I calculated the, the number of pixels that are actually on that area, and it's 16.9% uh, of, uh, of the complete screen. Um, that tells me that people who do that can make do with a limited number of pixels, and uh, that they can spend space on other things. For instance, all the space over here for the boxes and connectors for the node base editor. I also counted those pixels, 56% of the of the whole screen. And then I also thought like, oh, let's see how complicated it really is what they put up here. So I started counting boxes. 80 boxes are in there. Pippin, have a bonbon. <laughs> and, uh, while I was counting, I suddenly ended up at that that lower corner. And what did I see there? Hmm. A bit enlarged. It's not that funny. Uh, I saw what turns out to be a navigator. So you're only seeing a cut of what I would call a DNA new molecule of uh, of actually. Uh, 
of actual nodes in this graph. And that points at the problem that there is. I must say I was amazed. I thought that doing this for what's obviously a film is uh, it's just limited in what you can do. Limited because, for instance, the space that is there or the space reflects how, my, how limited it actually is. But you see there is a, a good amount of, uh, of boxes actually there and you're just seeing part of it, like part of a DNA module. Another factor to really be aware of, and it's a bit hard when you're looking at the still image, is time. Looking at what you're dealing with here is, and it explains why compositing is much farther in uh, moving pictures, is yeah, uh, 60 seconds of 24 frames is 1440 frames per minute, or 1440 images per minute that you have to deal with. And if you want to touch them up, doing that by hand is well, they used to do it like that, but labor has gone up in price, so uh, you cannot do that today anymore. Uh, another factor that you can see when you think about, okay, this is just something that moves along in time, and every image has got like 1 24th of a second that's actually seen. Yes, you can get away with murder. Uh, if it pa passes along very fast, then who's going to really notice it? So thinking about that, like how do you see that you can get away with this murder, I suddenly realized that when you work like this, you need to review your work and this is watching footage. So watching it for a second or more, what actually happens, what it looks like. So you see that in time, it takes time to review your seconds or more to review your footage. And after you've seen that, you plan your next step and you they need to figure out how in this graph you can actually achieve that or work with your timelines to actually say, here I want to do something extra or do something less or do something else. But you see that in this whole flow there is, there is actually time available. Uh, time passes automatically when you are actually watching the footage. So the, how you look at or how you experience time in this kind of tasks is set by what you're actually doing. Now we're moving on to GIMP. Took an image, it was one of mine myself. Uh, and yeah, the issue is immediately like, the whole thing is filled to the top and bottom edges. Most of the screen is taken up by this image. Now you can say, oh, is that your personal preference to work in this way, that when you work on images, they need to be big, maybe. You know, you always need to check. So. You can actually do this in a structural way by looking at the context of GIMP, actually. That wasn't me. So you look at the product vision, which means a statement of what GIMP is actually supposed to be, what it is for. And it is described there that it's for high-end photo manipulation. Well, bingo, uh, big images, uh, can never, your monitor can never be big enough when you're, uh, when you're working on that. Doing original art from found images, uh, again, a case of art. Serious <laughs> resolutions or anything, you're, you're up in the thousands of pixels. So again, your view of things can never be big enough. Just about gone through the, Mitch also takes a bonbon. <laughs> uh, that's, Three big groups, and this is already the third. Uh, it's not the whole thing. There's also other assets production, but production of web assets again tells you that you know suddenly you need a screen's width words, thousand pixels, or you need to make something that's that's quite high, or you need to lay out the whole set together to see if it matches. So again, space is needed. So yes. Most of the time when working with GIMP, you need a lot of space for your image, which is unlike what you can say of Nuke or Blender. Another factor that's very important in GIMP is that what users do there is handcrafted. Um, you can really say that the artistic or the designer value that is put into the work comes from the handcrafting. So anything that goes beyond what a robot could do or a computer could do by itself is where the artist or the designer puts in his 
his magic. This is part of understanding uh, the activity. It even goes back, did you understand this, putting this magic for layout work, design work, uh, production work, or real art, uh, already existed way before computers existed, and that it's just a continuation of that art and craft. Now, good question is, could I put a number on that? And indeed I can, that's why I'm showing it to you. Um, for that we'll have to look at a principle for GIMP in the context of GIMP that uh, I named in Brussels uh, the Holy Trinity. And uh, I introduced that because I took for years and years in discussions about this node-based editing look constantly took a look at uh, working uh, within GIMP. Basically the Holy Trinity tells you that there's three ways to do something, to achieve something in GIMP. First of all, you take a tool out of toolbox and you do it by hand. Actually, every time somebody in a discussion should say tool in the toolbox, should make this, should make this wave. It really helps to feel what it is about. Second way to do it, you select a, a command from the menu or a filter uh, and you apply this with a selection that tells you how strong and where it goes. Third way to do it, you do it via a layer operation with a mask. So this is for most facts and purposes already active in GIMP and once you've recognized the pattern, it becomes a guide of how you have to really build it out. And it creates possibilities and impossibilities. It creates to-dos and, uh, and things uh, you shouldn't do. Now the question is, which of these three is the best, is the most well, effective, purposeful, the best you can do for any given operation? And the answer is, I don't know, the developers don't know, only that user, one of a million that sits at the computer at that point in in the design task or the create task, actually know this. It depends on a hell of a lot of factors. So in general, you have to just balance it out and say one third chance that you actually, uh, actually one of these methods gonna know. So now we can do a calculation about how much is handcrafted. Now the toolbox tool, easily, that is really, that is handcrafted. It's handcrafted central. Uh, but that's not all of it. You also got the other two operations, the other two thirds. And as I said, those work with selections and masks, which in part are also again handcrafted. I mean, the real decisions of what should be in and out, uh, some of them are by copying and pasting something in into the mask, some of them are really handcrafted. So when you add that up, and actually this thing is recursive because within making the mask, that can be again a mask operation, etc. Well, you don't have to go recur recursive because at this point we already have a majority factor of handcrafted in the working GIMP. And this is again unlike in, uh, in Nuke and Blender where with those 24 images per second pa yeah, shooting by, you're actually quite helpless to do by hand anything about it. The most you can do is just give a vague indication of where you want some algorithm to, uh, to, actually, uh, to actually hold. Now let's combine the two. Big images and a majority of this is handcrafted. And now something happens if you combine the two. It happens that you, when you concentrate on this and you're working by hand, you get immersed. Basically what happens to users is you get a tunnel vision of uh, while working, you are inside this image and the power when you're working with the, with the toolbox tool is in your hand at that moment. Uh, what you get is into a flow of doing things. Uh, this is a flow of being creative, or this is simply a flow of being production, just make all those 200 buttons blue in a row. And, uh, and what we better not do is block that work by putting something in front of it. And as you notice, this, this factor of being in a flow inside this thing, this 
while you're doing one operation, you already know what is the next one because it's in front of you and you are there. It's very different than in these tools like Nuke and Blender where there is this review and then you do something, review kind of uh, face to it. The last factor in this context that I want to, uh, to mention is uh, that there are hundreds of, uh, of operations. Uh, it is very normal that uh, through this, uh, this handcraft that the number of operations you do on an image or part of an image just pile up. So that's a given. So, and that describes the context. Uh, the context uh, in that way programs the design work that, that one has in, uh, in, in front of him. To, uh, to review, there's not much space. You don't want to get in the way of the, of the flow. And, uh, and actually, so this is a space that's available to you. For the last week, I've been thinking, you know what? What if I, from this point, make my canvas this small, just to rub it in, in for all of us? Like, let's try to work in that in that part of the of the beamer. Actually, well, I chickened out. Um, <laughs> I am gonna, but all of the message is there. Like, if you want to really work uh, with nodes and with elements, they have to stay away from the black part and. That gray part is what at your disposal. Then the handcrafted. This node editing has a one-to-one -one relationship with this handcrafting activity that happens on that canvas, that part that we couldn't use anyway. And uh, this node editing has a one-to-one -one relation with the actual flow that people are in. And as mentioned, hundreds of operations. So you see that um, the context gives you a lot of burden, but the context also takes it away. Uh, the context, these limitations actually tell you where you can uh, find solutions, and that's in a couple of minutes is what we're going to do now, just to uh, just to give an overview. And basically, this context you cannot go in denial of it. You just have to roll with it, and if you don't want to roll with it, you will always be part of the problem. So I made a small graph. You can see it's, it's quite small. There are not many nodes. And I want to show how the context can help you because the points where two lines come together are compositor nodes, so things get uh, put together. Think of layer modes. And uh, that's one of them. And if you give these compositors, compositors a name, then what you actually have is a layer. Uh, layers are nothing else but organizational methods for users to uh, to keep to keep on top of uh, of all their stuff there is uh, there is in their uh, in their composition. Now, once you focus on this black one, you have a context. That's the layer. That's where you are working. So. You can sort of blend the rest out, at least in, not in the image, but for sure in your UI. You don't have to concentrate the other thing because the context where you are working is just that, that subtree there. And when you've done that, then you see you still can compact this a bit more by saying, well, that line that went through it is actually trivial. So why do I have to draw it? Why can I pack these elements together into something, yeah, in a stack like this? So black is the context and the white is the things you are actually doing there. And when you do that, you can block out the rest and you see that instead of a screen filling graph that is where your work was, you have a chance to look at your full image to fully immerse yourself in there and on the side of that, within the context, have full access to the actual node-based uh, non-destructive actions that you're actually doing there. So, it's my last minute. What a coincidence. Uh, um, so just to remind you, I was here to tell you how a context really sets up the, the design task that you got ahead of you and sort of 
really creates your own environment in which you have to, to solve the problems. I wasn't here to tell the people of Nuke or the people of Blender how they really should be doing things. They work in a different context, they need different solutions. And with that, I finish my talk <laughs> on the stove.